Hello, everybody. Welcome to the fifth and last episode of our podcast. Today, we are going to be talking about the reflection of what this project has brought us and what are its possible implications in the future. This episode will be hosted by me, Teresa, and by my guest. Hey, good afternoon to everybody. Um, hello. So I have a, a first question to ask you. So just in general, how did you find the project? Can you say something about it? Uh, to be honest, it was quite challenging to get to know the other side of the Internet. Uh, nevertheless, it was very rewarding and insightful to see what truly really happens within the community and what do the actions of individuals look like as well as what we're the worth to be. Mm-hmm. So how, do you, how did you find the, the GAP members when you tried to communicate with them through, through messages? It was very interesting. So uh, the majority of people uh, we talked to seem to have a need to justify everything and point out that the things they thought to be true were actually justifiable with videos or certain facts, books. I would even say they used scholarly methods, which I'm used to from, uh, from university. However, I found that there was some sort of over-interpretation of everything they brought to us and the sources of, uh, that they used. Overall, I would say that a large portion of the people had a certain gut complex uh, because they thought of themselves as the better part of the population. But nevertheless, they were still real people with real problems. Uh, During the interviews, we talked uh, uh, to a woman who really was not feeling well, and she talked to us about her illness, uh, which was kind of touching. Um, It was also interesting that not everybody who is a user of GAP uh, identified themselves as a member of QNO. Some people were literally kind of against, but um, this politician we talked to, was actually talking uh, telling us that he's not a member of QAnon, yet the things he posted sort of were there to conform to the QAnon community to become appealing to them. Yes. Um, so how do you think this was the answer to our research question? To be honest, social media plays a crucial role in fostering the expansion of conspiracy theories. It is actually social media that transforms a believer of a conspiracy theory into a member of a group based on conspiracy. Mm-hmm. And by the way, how, how do you think is this fostering done? Okay, so we discovered that uh, basically social media creates many phenomena, which we came across in our literary, literary reviews. Uh, such as echo chambers, which accelerated the speed uh, with which the conspiracy theories were spread. And then there was also the gatekeeping effect that you talked about. And furthermore, we also tried to look at algorithms. And these algorithms really, especially in the trending section of Gab, do you remember that section? Yeah, 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 I do remember. It was quite a a section indeed. Yes, it was putting forward uh, the messages of uh, users which were the most popular, especially those which paid for their account. So those uh, algorithms were, had no true selections. They literally brought whichever kind of messages, even especially messages. messages. How, how, would you, how would you describe them? Stemming from hate speech? Yes, yes, definitely. Um, also, uh, there uh, was this one person uh, that we encountered and we asked him about the effects of offline communities that... Uh, uh, are brought towards Gap. And he talked to us uh, about his way of discovering Gap, which was actually through a friend uh, of his, whom, whom he knows. And there was a certain paradox because ev- even though the friend brought him to Gap, uh, it was the man who stayed as, a, as an active member, even though his friend uh, left Gap and uh, even QAnon. But at the same time, there was truly a sense of community uh, because, for example, certain members of QAnon, when I chatted with them, uh, told me that they had to cut off their family completely just because they didn't feel comfortable around them anymore and their families also didn't feel comfortable because they were members of QAnon. So do you think... uh, 
there were, it was challenging to do? And what were the challenges that we faced doing this project? This was a very difficult topic. Uh, firstly, because of uh, one, uh, the prejudice. We had to communicate with people who posted quite polarized things, uh, for example, regarding vaccines and far right content. So we wanted to avoid first uh, them in real life. And second was anonymity and lack of accountability, uh, as well as uh, time and pressure, uh, which was quite strong. And the, the fact that the first time for everything, we had to, as always, figure our way around the different surprises that were there. Mm -hmm. um, by the way, talking about surprises, did you have any regarding this project? Well, perhaps the most significant one was Gap. As a, as a platform of social media, you know, you always expect the QAnon and the uh, conspiracy theories platforms to be a bit outdated and not very reliant, also with ugly graphics, let's say, but Gap was actually a pretty good form of social media. It was very easy to use and familiar, I guess, because it was based a bit on Facebook and on how face, like the discussion of Facebook works. Uh, but yes, it was better than Facebook in the sense that it was self-sufficient. Like you didn't need to leave the website and you could still find many things there and you could form a community there, which was uh, interesting. Uh, and again, coming back to this politician, we can really reflect on the fact that he himself made his campaign on Gab. It was the primary uh, social media that he used. Sure, because he wanted to um, appeal to the QAnon community and uh, to wh whatever sorts of communities, right-wing communities that there are uh, on Gab. But still, it, this um, for, uh, platform allowed him to do it, which was for me definitely surprising how far we've come in terms of uh, social media. So I would like to right now ask you, um, what do you think we can do with this research? What do you think this research told us and how can we apply it further? How can this research be applied further? That's a very good question. Uh, for example, it would be important to research uh, Q and especially like this from the inside to understand the transition of people and the self-proclaimed justification of their behavior. Mm -hmm. Also, we could look at bonds between the offline and online community as well as the agenda of the communities in the future. What do you mean by bonds between online and offline community? Well, online and, commu and offline communities are, uh, have essentially different degrees of visibility. Uh, since we now have recently access, in, when it comes to research, to the ability to get into the community in the online world, it's essentially also interesting to see what implication it has on the offline world, which we can't directly examine. Mm -hmm. And for this, it would somehow require to go further into the community. Mm -hmm. Do you think it also shows us some new ways to perform research on conspiracy theories, communities, such as QAnon? Not just on conspiracy theories, uh, the, the ability to investigate online and to join online a community is essentially a new method of research that wasn't available before because people would have, uh, for example, sociologists would have to integrate in the group directly on the field, which is much more complicated than mm -hmm. doing this online. Mm -hmm. Definitely. I see, I see. So uh, thank you very much uh, for this interview and for this episode of podcast. And thanks to all of our listeners as well for uh, going through this journey with us. Um, it was truly a pleasure for me. I hope that also for you to make this project and to learn something new and also to challenge ourselves. Um, yes. So <laughs> see you next time. I guess. <laughs>